host and the superhero of microphone handling. <laughs> Come back to us, please. Uh, okay, I think we're gonna take a 10 minute break now uh, for a coffee that is served in the corner. Uh, so we go out of the room and to the corner where you see big windows, that's where the coffee station is. And we return five past 11 to resume our uh, morning plenary. Thank you so much. And during the break, I can put also the presentation uh, of our next keynote speakers uh, on the computer. With our plenary sessions, and we have uh, three keynote addresses in this part by Professor Rudy Rus, by Professor Mahesh Diaz, and by Professor Vishnia Rajit. So, uh, without further ado, I would like to invite our first keynote speaker for this session, Professor Rudy Rus. The floor is yours. <laughs> Well, that's a good start. I, I better stop now while I'm... <laughs> okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. First, I want to thank uh, Anna and the Polish colleagues for inviting uh, me and us and the students and colleagues here. And, of course, uh, congratulate you with the anniversary of, uh, of the university. I've been here nearly a week, but I still will not try to pronounce the university's name because it's still a struggle for us. Um, okay. I'm... Um, it's very fascinating to be in, uh, in, uh, in Poland, of course, and in Warsaw, because it's uh, also historically a very interesting place, not only because of its involvement in the evolutions that led to the fall of the Iron Curtain and the Solidarnosc movement that uh, we witnessed as when I was young and had long hair, and that's <laughs> been a long time ago, but, uh, but also, of course, because of the Korczak movement in Poland and its, uh, its, uh, well, its uh, influence on the children's rights movement. And, uh, of course, Poland was important in, in uh, the f drafting the, the, the convention. And I think in 79 they decided on, on uh, uh, trying to draft uh, the convention. And a famous Polish lawyer, Adam Lopatka, was involved. And we as a department in, in uh, Ghent University have a direct contact or had a direct contact. I, I used to work at the Center of Children's Rights in our department with Professor Eugene Verhelen and, and Lopatka also contributed to the books in the conferences we organized. So, so it's fascinating to, to be here in this uh, also historically very important place. I'm going to be very brief. I have, uh, I have t uh, 20 minutes, so I'm going to cut some corners. And um, just first say I'm a professor of social work at Ghent University, and we're here with a group of students and, and some other colleagues. Um, and I'm going to uh, say something about children's rights discourse in a critical perspective. But first, I want to show you some things for those who do not know Belgium. These are Belgium things we are famous for. We saw the waffles and the french fries uh, already here. Fritzky, Bel Belgsky, something like that. Um, and the waffles. But uh, we also, well, I had nothing to do with it. But, uh, um, the saxophone, Adolf Sax was Belgium. Jacques Brel was Belgium, not French try to remember it. Um, we have the chocolates um, and we have the trappist beer and the ridiculous statue in the midst is little man P. I have no idea why it's famous. For some reason it is. It's in Brussels. Uh, feel free to not visit it when you visit Brussels. <laughs> um, I won't tell you which one is my, uh, of my, f is my favorite on the picture, but it's not the chocolate, not the french fries, not the saxophone, not Jacques Brel, not the waffles, not Manneke P. <laughs> and not Tintin is the, the cartoon, Kofi, Tintin. Um, I almost forgot that we, one of our colleagues has 17,000 comic books, Philip, who's here, so you can ask him more about that. Okay, uh, so something about Belgium. It's a fun country. Critical to what? Uh, so the title was Critical uh, uh, Discourse, and, and of course, when one is critical, we ask, what will you be critical about? And I think my, my short, very brief talk today is... is uh, taking a critical stance towards the idea that the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child, uh, the growing attention for children's rights, you might say, is a, uh, a, an unambiguous move forward towards more respect. I want to make some reflections towards the idea that children are, by definition, of better with children's rights. Um, 
and as a disclaimer, I want to say I'm very much in favor of children's rights, and I, I used to work a lot around children's rights, but I started as a big believer, more is better, and I, over the last uh, decades, I might say, I changed my perspective a little bit in the idea that we should look critical at them, and what do we mean with children's rights, and how do we implement them, uh, and how do we translate them into practice, and, um, and it, it's, uh, it's not only about having more rights, it's also about what we do with them. So I want to briefly have, uh, have some reflections on that. And as I said, children's rights are often seen as a, and the attention for children's rights as a move forward, um, um, a move forward towards more respect for children. When, uh, when the United Nations Convention in 89 came into being, Le Monde, a famous uh, a French uh, newspaper, heading was uh, de l'amour vers le respect, uh, from, uh, from love to respect. So we go from love, loving refers to maybe something paternalistic emotion, to respect, which is kind of more rational. Uh, it's about the, the position of children in society. It's about structural elements. Um, so we go from protection to participation. Uh, this was a big idea uh, in, uh, when, the, when the UN Convention in, in 1989 came into being. And from a Western point of view, and of course I speak from a Western point of view, I speak from a point of view of a, uh, a Belgian context or a European context, uh, often also context where we have still have a welfare state, but the uh, UN Convention was often seen as a, a geopolitical contract uh, of uh, uh, where the whole world nearly ratified the UN Convention, uh, initially not the US and Somalia. Somalia did in 2015, I think. It was the last country to ratify uh, the UN Convention, uh, which was seen as it's the most ratified document on rights in the world. And it's seen as a geopolitical contract that all over the world we now will move towards respect for children. It was also a, a move from soft law to hard law, the former children's rights instruments were um, declarations. Uh, now we had a convention for the non-illegally scholared uh, a, a, a declaration is more a moral claim. You know, we say that we will abide to these laws. Uh, a convention is something that you install in your legal order and has more legal power. So it's, it's a more hard uh, law instead of the soft law. And it's a comprehensive text and in the Western contract context, often the participation rights are stressed. We already had a lot of focus on protection rights, protection from abuse, uh, for instance. We had a focus on uh, provision rights, uh, schooling, the right to uh, healthcare, et cetera. And now we also had, and this was seen in, in, in uh, our Western context anyway, as the, the most new thing, which were the, the rights of children to be heard and the participation of children and the right to take their perspective into account in all things that matter to them. And uh, in the work we do and did in the past and do in, in our research now, it's often these participation rights uh, which are stressed. We have to uh, listen to, to children, take the voice of children into account, as we also see in the, in the, the project here, in the, the uh, exposition. And, uh, and I'm not saying, of course, this is not a, 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 an important move forward can be an important move forward towards more respect, but it's not so unambiguous. And we wrote a book some years ago, or edited a book better with some colleagues on critical perspectives on children's rights, crit critical perspectives on the convention. I can say in all confidence it's a brilliant book because it's in Dutch, so no one of you will read it, um, which makes me very reassuring to say uh, how good it is. Uh, why is it ambiguous? So the move forward is, is not that it's not all getting better, and of course, one element is um, we move forward in terms of recognizing rights and ratifying the convention, <coughs> and ratifying, um, I mean, after the convention, there were other legal instruments uh, put into place, and we ratify them, but of course, it's not because we ratified laws, and we have laws, and we have decrees that they are put into place. I mean, if we look at the Ukrainian war, for instance, if we look at the COVID cri crisis, uh, it's very clear that the rights of children are often violated. Yeah, it's not because we have all these legal tools, and even if they are installed in our legal system, that we also, uh, or that we do not violate children's rights, and that we do not, and that we do respect them. 
But even if we, if we are formally realizing rights, uh, uh, and if we put them into place also in concrete practice, it's also not always uh, the case that, they, that, is it, that it is uh, um, experienced by children as uh, such. Uh, um, I did a lot of work in the past on the right to participation, and where we see a lot of formal installment of participation which from the perspective of children themselves can mean absolutely nothing or can be even very detrimental. Uh, um, I, uh, I used to work in child protection and youth care, residential care before I came into the university and I remember discussions on uh, uh, the right of children to complain and we installed a letter box where they could put their complaints in and we saw educators saying, no, no, don't complain to me anymore, put it in the letter you know, so I, I'm, I'm getting rid of your complaints, you don't bother me anymore with your complaints. So it's not because you install, or oh, we have these, uh, inspired by Korczak in our institution, a lot of uh, um, uh, b boards where youngsters in the institution meet, uh, and they discuss the policy of the institution, but it is the educators who decide what can be discussed or cannot be discussed. So we will meet every week, but you cannot talk about the uh, hours that you can go out, or you cannot talk about this, or you cannot. So you can participate, but on our terms. So you can formalize very, very many things, but it doesn't mean children expect, uh, experience it as being, being respectful or being um, empowering, of course. Rights can be used uh, as a tool to individualize social problems. Uh, I, see, I think we saw this in the child poverty debate. In, in Belgium, we have a lot of attention for child poverty, one of, the, uh, one of the tools that is used are the children's rights. The children's rights are violated by poverty, and of course, this is true. Uh, but how is it misused to individualize social problems in a sense that uh, because we focus on child poverty, we blame parents. You know? And the idea is children have not made the uh, wrong decisions yet. We can train them to make the right decisions because we are in a context where poverty is more and more seen as a problem of individual choices which are made and wrong choices made by poor people. And so the idea is, you know, once you're an adult, it's your own fault. You know, children are still, uh, you know, um, not guilty of making wrong choices. So we will focus on child poverty rather than on poverty as a problem that also affects families uh, and, and adults and society as a whole, of course. So also this is the children's rights discourse can be used uh, uh, to, to, cul you know, to, to have a, a bad perspective on, on parents and adults. I will come back to that later. And I think the main problem is, and, and I said again, this is from my Western uh, <coughs> European perspective, but if we look at the children's rights discourses in many of our educational contexts, uh, uh, in schools, in youth work, in youth care, uh, in early childhood, we often see a very individual technical discourse on children's rights. And with a specific idea about a good citizen and a good child, because uh, with the rights, this is the discourse that we're seeing, with rights come duties, and the duty of the child with rights is to be a competent, uh, autonomous citizen of at least wanting to become one, you know, to, to wanting to be empowered by the adults that give you the rights. That is that kind of idea that exists. I think the ladder of heart has been very detrimental in that effect, not, a, not intentionally by Roger Hart itself, but the idea that, I don't know if you know this ladder, the higher up the ladder, the more participation, and this has been often used as uh, if, if you're not high up the ladder, it's not real participation of you're not good enough and we, you need to get you, you know, up on the highest rung where you take your initiatives yourself, you're really active, you're really participative. And of course, um, the ladder can be used in, in interesting ways as well and not necessarily has to be misused in that way. But what we see is a, is a, a, a boomerang for those who do not live up to this participative idea. You know, I saw this in youth care, youngsters who have no interest in participating in formal uh, negotiation structures with the school or with the youth care institution can be seen as bad youngsters. You know, we give them the chance to participate and they don't want to, which is of course, you could say they're right not to live up to our expectations. And we see this individualistic approach, of course, in society. Resilience is the new buzzword. We used to have individual empowerment as the 
the mantra. Uh, now it's more and more in our text, the resilience of youngsters. And I have, of course, nothing against resilience of youngsters. Uh, but uh, the risk is that we put all the pressure on youngsters themselves to become resistant because they now have the rights to participate. It becomes often, and I'm, as I said, I'm cutting corners. It's a very brief talk, so I have to be a bit unnuanced. But we also see a very much a judicial debate, uh, what I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's it's about often about formalizing rights, about uh, putting rights formally into place rather than discussing more global social problems. I see this, for instance, and it's, this is not only with children's rights, the case also with adults, but if we look at youth care, for instance, a lot of children are placed in institutions who live in poverty. We discuss much more the participation of, of those youngsters in the institutions than that we discuss the poverty and the reasons that they are placed in institutions. Right. So in, in the framework of children's rights, uh, we often or can run the risk of ignoring the social political aspect of youth care, for instance, you know, and discuss on, first we put them in institutions and then we, we, so we also see this with adults. Eh? I do work in prisons and we never incarcerated so many people uh, as we do today, but they have a lot of rights to participate. So first we lock them up and we tell them you know, they can be involved in our structures. Why the reasons why, we, why they are incarcerated has to do with what Derek, can have to do with what Derek mentioned is, is the, you know, the, the, the fact that we focus more on, on law than on education, for instance. Yeah. So. And we see rights as an end of dialogue. This is a fun discussion I often have with lawyers. They think if we put a law in, the, in place, you know, it's, we made a move forward, which is not necessarily true. And the last element I want to discuss is, because uh, I have to come to an end, it also leads to what can be called a misanthropic view on adulthood. Vanessa Pupavac uh, wrote interesting stuff about it a long time ago, where she says it's, we see that the way the children's rights are promoted in a, in a certain way can lead to a misanthropic view on adulthood where adults are the bad ones. And we see this, uh, and I don't want to pick a fight, but also organizations as UNICEF and UNESCO are not really free from this kind of, dis or have not been free from this kind of discourses in the past. We see this, for instance, in the debates on international adoption. I used to be involved in international adoption schemes in, in Belgium. and. You see a very romantic idea sometimes of we're gonna save the children from the south, you know, because we are in a rich country. We're gonna save children from a poor country. And Vanessa Popovac, Popovac analyzed what you see is there that children's rights are used to to in, to install a discourse that the parents in the global south are not really good parents, you know, and we can take better care of them. While of course the problem there is is a colonization is inequality, is poverty again, you know, is uh, global injustice. And this kind of romantic misuse of children's rights is a risk where you see uh, uh, that uh, the idea that adults are not good adults if they don't respect or don't realize the rights of their child is something that we, I think we should be aware of. And also, and I put it in bold, is a, a risk of a culpabil culpabilization of educators. Um, and this is, I think, if we have this kind of individualistic, technical approach of children's rights in our, uh, in our educational system, it, it becomes about, are we okay with the children's rights in our education? And I see sometimes it becomes a ticking box exercise, but I also see educators backing out of difficult situations because they are afraid of violating the rights of children. Uh, I once had a discussion with an educator that, with a policymaker that said, th it was an educator in a, a residential care institution and uh, the, the child has had thrown something to the head of the educator and the educator said, before you get a cookie at four o'clock with milk, you need to apologize. And, and uh, the policymaker says, this is violating the children's rights, you know, because you refuse them food. And so the educator said, well, next time I'm not saying anything anymore. And, you know, I just don't do my job anymore. Or we avoid children which are difficult because with difficult children with difficult problems, there might be a higher risk of violating their rights. So you get something very defensive uh, uh, in educators, which is very uh, counterproductive, I think, to, to realizing the rights of children. 
So we need to go, that was my point, towards a more social political discourse on children's rights or reclaim that where it's disappeared. Um, which is seeing that the U UN Convention, I think, is, it's a, and this is for the European context also, it's, a, th it's the government that uh, signed it and, and ratified it. So it's a, that's why I asked the question on the welfare state also. What is the governmental responsibility of putting systems into place? Eh? Um, it's not only about the role of individual educators. Children's rights, reclaiming it as a part of the broader human rights movement, and I think this is important because we saw, for instance, with COVID, that also elderly people, their rights were violated, and we have now a, a movement in Belgium on elderly rights that is rising, and I think children's rights and elderly rights and human rights should have a solidarity movement and not be seen as a, you know, opposite to each other. And I think it's a repolitization of, of, of or ask for repolitization of educational practice where we are, and this is what Derek said, I think, we question about our discretion, or use of discretion, and, and I think we should focus less on this individual uh, perspective of development of children, and uh, it's not one or the other, we need them both, but also focus on you know, global social developments and, and how we align ourselves with uh, developments in society and be more critical towards those. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you about this uh, very inspiring talk on children's rights. I'll take this opportunity uh, to make a little announcement about the book that was published last year. Mine? Not yours, <laughs> sorry. No, uh, it's, a, it's a book um, put together by Basia Vucic and um, Ms. Sankowska. Um, it, it is about um, early, early um